Welcome to Break Forth Fully Alive. We are Elsa and Arlen Salty, your hosts and the directors and founders of Break Forth Ministries. We can all use a little inspiration in our day, and that's why Break Forth Fully Alive is here for you. After four decades of holding events throughout the world, we're pulling together some of the best of the best messages and classes from these events. But before we get into today's show, we want to invite you to head over to our website at BreakforthMinistries.com, where you'll learn more about our tours to the lands of the Bible, our resources, inspiring videos, workshops, our events, and more. Now, let's get started. There are five walls that keep men locked into a hopeless rut of trying harder and experiencing less and less of God's presence. This session will enable men to tear down walls such as stubborn resistance and disconnected isolation. Now, here's Stephen. All right, so if you have this question, why isn't my Christian life working? Uh, Or why is this nagging thing that I have not going away. Why am I always dealing with this one thing? Did you did you just say your wife when I said nagging thing? He did. He said that is, but all right, that wasn't what I was talking about. So anyway, if if you uh, have something that you really are struggling with, I'm hoping that maybe this could be an experience where um, something might break forth or something like that, and uh, you would have. Uh, some new insight. That's what I've been praying about here. Uh, I do have attention deficit disorder. I'll have some questions at the end. So if you want to think of a question or a comment, it needs to be short because if it's too long, I forget what you're saying and I answer some other uh, question. So uh, I, I, I was, um, I'll tell you a quick story. I was driving uh, to an event. We got in late. Uh, I like to drive. We had a van. My team was in the van and uh, we went to Taco Bell because it was the only thing that was open at midnight and uh, everybody ordered. We got the stuff. I gave him the credit card, got it back. They go to the hotel and I can't find my credit card. Well, a um, friend of mine was with me, Wes. He was already over in the trash looking to see if I'd thrown my credit card away when I threw my Taco Bell trash away uh, into the trash can. And so I looked over, I saw him doing that. I said, Wes, have you found my credit card? He said, no, but I found these. And he pulled out the rental car keys that I had thrown away in the trash <laughs> with the Taco Bell trash. So, uh, you know, I have a real case of this thing. And, uh, you know, some people uh, blame irresponsibility uh, on their attention deficit disorder. And I, I don't do that. I blame everything on it. So if you can't follow along, uh, sorry. One of my favorite verses is John 10, 10, because it kind of clarifies that Satan is the one that comes to steal and to destroy, right? But it is the purpose of Jesus to give us a rich and a satisfying life. And one of the things that I've discovered is that the number one treatment of choice that people make whenever they encounter a problem, what would you say that would be? What would be the number one treatment of choice that people would make or hope for whenever they encounter a problem? What would it be? Ignore it. Well, that might be, that that might be the first thing, but after that, so the number two treatment that people would uh, have there, uh, thanks for, I'll I'll write that down. Maybe the number two would be uh, what? After you ignore it, then you, then you shoot it. Exactly. So the third, uh, number one uh, treatment. So you try to deny the problem, then you try to shoot it. And then the next thing you would do is uh, try harder. Uh, yeah, that that's uh, very common. Hey, why don't I just tell you the answer? Since I know I got it's kind of stupid us doing that. So anyway, and those were very interesting answers here in Edmonton. Uh, <laughs> But the number one treatment of us Christians is ask God to fix it. That's what we do. And then here's the key. key. When, When God doesn't fix it, well, then we can use that as an excuse to keep our problem. Well, hey, I ask him every day to change this. 
and he didn't do it. I asked him to take it away from me every day, but he wouldn't do it. So, hey, <laughs> boy, I'm, I'm amazing. Every day I wanted this thing to change, but God didn't do it. What a wimpy way of living a Christian life. There's something beyond just asking God to fix it, waiting for God to do what God is waiting for us to do. Romans 12, 2 says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Or a better translation says, be transformed by changing the way that you think. So I'm believing that if I could help you change the way that you think a little bit, that there might be the potential for transformation to start in your life. And that's really all I'm interested in. I don't like to make people feel better. In fact, I like to make people feel really bad. Come up afterwards, I'll help you feel really bad about yourself. I want people to feel so bad that they might want to change versus what a lot of times we do is we try to make people feel good and put a Band-Aid on something that really needs a very, very uh, serious action or a help. So we don't want to do that. So we want people sometimes to hurt, and sometimes we actually have to hurt people because not all hurt is harmful, is it? Is it? No, it's not. Okay. You guys are right with me. It's, uh, it's great. Fabulous. Good feeling. All right. So in order to get to this place where we're working through the problems that we have in front of us, I'm going to talk to you about five walls that we need to tear down, especially us men need to tear down these five walls that can lead to that Christian life we've been looking for, to that fulfillment that God has promised us. I love uh, the internet. I love looking uh, at YouTube. And one of my favorite videos is, um, there's a, you can find it on there. There's a, a guy, he's got this dog, and he's got a screen door with no screen on it. It's just a, a frame. And he's got this dog sitting here, and, and the door opens to his backyard. When the door is shut, now there's nothing on the door, it's just a frame. When the door is shut, the dog will not go through it. But when he opens the frame that has nothing on it, the dog will go outside. He shuts it, he can step through it, the dog will stay right there, won't, won't dare go through this thing. And then when he steps back through and then opens it, the dog goes through it. Well, a lot of us have in our lives these phantom walls like that, that we don't go through. We don't see them. We don't even know what they are a lot of times, but we don't go through them. And uh, we, we need some help to, um, to see uh, what it is that we don't see. And that's what I want to help you uh, with today. So we can see maybe what we don't see that's preventing us from moving forward uh, in this Christian life. The first thing, it's on your high paper there, is stubborn resistance. Now, this is a big one. This is a big one. At New Life, we do, um, we do weight loss workshops. We do every man's battle workshops, weight loss, marriage, all sorts of things. But when we do a weight loss workshop, I used to weigh uh, 80 pounds more than I do right now. And uh, I was essentially carrying a, a fifth grader around with me all the time. And, and I, I learned to keep the weight off and I help other people do it. But we have people come to these things, they're in wheelchairs, very wide wheelchairs, oxygen tubes uh, in their nose, they can't walk, maybe they purchased an airplane ticket or two tickets to get there. And we're sitting there and I say, you know, there's something that, that all of us have in common, even though you've paid a lot of money to be here, you've gone to a lot of trouble, it hasn't been pleasant to get here. So we all have this one thing in common, and that is that we stubbornly resist something that can help us. We want to believe that we've got it all figured out. And many of those people come to a weight loss workshop not to get better, but to prove that they can't get better. Does that make sense? They come believing that nobody's got anything new to tell them, and they're justified to sit there in that wheelchair with their oxygen tubes and to never, ever get better. That is the ultimate form of stubborn resistance. We become the kings of stubborn resistance, and we get in these 
ruts. It's all about my stuff, my rights, all this stuff. Um, this is the way you married me, and this is the way I'm going to be. Now, that is one turn on <laughs> for a woman that just, I mean, I'm telling you, you do that, and uh, you, you've got a problem. But if you've ever said that, this is the way you married me, and this is the way I'm going to be, that is kind of the ultimate stubborn resistance to anything. Now, in the Christian world, we all talk about how we love each other, but we reject everybody for whatever reason we can. If you don't believe the right way, if you're, you know, if you're Pentecostal or Southern Baptist or premillennial or whatever it is, we find all these different ways to resist and to stubbornly stake out my territory with my rights and the things that I deserve. And you can imagine why we feel so alienated and isolated in our Christian faith is because we're kind of afraid to look at it in any other different way. So stubborn resistance is probably the biggest thing standing in our way and a different way of living and a different way of experiencing life that God wants for us to have. Now, I uh, used to have a boat and um, on a lake, and and uh, one day I took some uh, kids out, and, and and the boat just shut off. And uh, we had all these kids in the boat. We had about twelve kids in this boat, wanting to have fun, ski, inner tube, and all this kind of stuff. And and the boat was dead. So uh, I called the marina, and they sent a boat out with gasoline, filled it up with gasoline. The boat was still dead. Nothing. So we, we end up, rather than having a fun day, we, we end up being pulled back to the marina. The marine mechanic out, he looks down, takes his head, and he flips the kill switch back on, turns the key, and the boat starts right back up, making me look like a stupid idiot to all these kids who wanted to have a good time. Now, that boat was not going to work no matter what, no matter how much gas, if that kill switch was off. There is a kill switch in every person that you have to flip on if you want to find the life that God has for you. And it's the answer to stubborn resistance. And it's, it's called willingness. Willingness. If you aren't willing... You are dead in your Christian walk. I, there's no word that I'm going to say today that's more valuable other than Jesus. I'll say that one. That's really valuable. Jesus, of course, than willingness. And I would just ask you to evaluate, what is my willingness? Willingness to try something different in my marriage. Willingness as a single person uh, to connect with other people in a different way. Willingness to experience life from a different way. That is the opposite of stubborn resistance is willingness. And it's, uh, it's not easy to develop. You know, uh, you have Outback Steakhouse here, right? Going to Outback Steakhouse, they had these uh, deep fried onion blossoms. And you know that people die every day from eating these deep fried onion blossoms. <laughs> It's a death trap. They have, uh, if you look, next time you go in and look, they got defibrillators around the room uh, just so they can uh, zap people back once the arteries have clogged up and they've started to, to die. And they, you know, they can't save everybody uh, and they don't want to hurt their business. So rather than drag them out front, they drag them out back. That's why it's called Outback Stakeout. They <laughs> drag them out the back. Most people know that. <laughs> you're sitting there you can want to be help, feel, uh, healthy you can be aware that those things kill you but you have to be willing to say no to something that a lot of people say yes to and that's the ultimate willingness is to say no to something that a lot of people are saying yes to and say yes to something that a lot of people are saying no to willingness
So I would ask you to evaluate your willingness. Second thing, the second wall is arrogant entitlement. For the arrogantly entitled person, enough is never enough. In fact, more than enough is never enough. Expectations are so high that nobody can ever meet those expectations. It's an, uh, an adolescent mindset where there's never any contentment. And it's the belief that I deserve more than I have, uh, that I'm something special, and that uh, God has somehow forgotten all the stuff that I deserve to have and need and want, and I'm entitled to it. Now, what's interesting, sometimes a stubbornly resistant man might be married to an arrogantly entitled woman. He's saying, well, I'm not going to change. This is the way I, I was when we got married, and it's the way I'm going to be. And she might be saying, why can't you be more like Bob? Bob, you can spell his name backwards and forwards, the same. He, uh, he's got a great job. Look at the vacations, Bob. And, and so she might feel entitled to more than you can ever deliver. In fact, one of the most dangerous things in the area of arrogant entitlement is comparing what you have to somebody else. So why God says don't do it. And whereas I believe most commonly every man's battle is a battle with lust and pornography, I believe that for a woman, a more common battle is the battle to not compare her spouse to somebody else's spouse. Because if you have a stubbornly resistant person married to an arrogantly entitled, why can't you be? You've got a pretty horrible relationship dynamic going where there's very little connection. And so the arrogantly entitled person has to find the answer just like the stubbornly resistant person does. Uh, by the way, under stubborn resistance, you could list Psalm 51, 12. Restore the joy of your salvation and make me willing to obey you. That's the verse. But the arrogantly entitled person, this self-centered entitlement, the cure for this, of course, is humility, which it's uh, very difficult to ever go wrong with humility. James 3.13 says, if you are wise and understand God's ways, prove it by living an honorable life, doing good works with humility that come from wisdom. So you got stubborn resistance, arrogantly entitled people. And then here's, maybe this is the, maybe those are walls and maybe this is the fortress. And that is justifiable resentment. So two people that are not connected emotionally, spiritually, sexually start to build up the justification for why they are so angry and resentful and bitter toward this other person. Now, I think justifiable resentment is the most dangerous thing that you can carry around with you because if you ever share with somebody what you're going through, what you're experiencing, what are they going to say? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I, I can understand why you would still be angry about that. You're justified in that. So they, they kind of keep you stuck in your resentment rather than helping you get out of it because you're so justified. And some of you have been through some stuff and you are absolutely justified in your anger, resentment, and bitterness. What does the Bible tell us to do? It says to get rid of all. And, you know, all pretty much means all, wherever you see it. So no matter how justified we are in the resentment, we still have to go through this forgiveness process. Now, some people say, well, I'm not going to forgive till somebody asks me to forgive. Me. Well, that's kind of stupid because then you're allowing somebody to have a space in your head that doesn't deserve to be there because forgiveness is not for somebody else. It's for you to release yourself from that person 
who has hurt you or done something wrong to you. So in our justifiable resentment, we don't hurt other people. We hurt it. Some people say, well, if I forgive, I would endorse what they are doing. That is not true. Or I would excuse it. That is not true. You're not endorsing or excusing. You're letting it go. You're, you're truly kind of hitting the bottom line of the Christian faith. You're practicing the forgiveness that Jesus showed us uh, to how to practice by sacrificing his very own life. Now, can you think of any situation where a person would not need to forgive another person? Can you think of an exception to the rule? Anybody? A really severe thing that's not forgivable. What's that? So Satan wants us to hold on to some offense and believe that this is the exception to the rule. But uh, every, everything can be and should be forgiven. This uh, gal, Karen Williams, wrote this. She says, I nursed it. I nourished it. I tucked it in at night. I focused on it, dwelt upon it, held it oh so tight. I cuddled it, coddled it. My energy I gave. And now this great big grudge I've grown has made me its slave. And that's what it does. So uh, Proverbs 27.3 shows us, a stone is heavy and sand is weighty, but the resentment caused by a fool is even heavier. The cure for justifiable resentment, of course, is forgiveness and, and letting it go. Letting God handle the end result, allowing ourselves to be free. Now, I know people that have gone 50 years of their life still resentful and bitter over something that happened at age 12 or 22. And at some point, we have to find a way to work through and experience and feel the freedom that comes only when we forget. Fourth big wall, especially for us men, big wall, is disconnected isolation. Now, um, if you're like me, um, I was kind of, uh, well, I was raised in a family where we were not connected. You know, it was all about what you did and not about what you felt. In fact, nobody cared what we felt. I, I, nobody ever even asked me how I felt about anything. And so I was kind of the lone ranger. And, I, and so I kind of developed this avoider personality. A lot of us men do that. How many uh, would you, you say you're more of an avoider than a connector? Yeah. So uh, quite a few of us here. And... Um, and we kind of think that's the way to go. It's okay. And we miss out on relationship. When it comes to marriage, if you are disconnected and isolated from the person you're married to, then nothing is going to work properly. And so we, we have to find a way, especially in marriage, to connect properly with somebody of the opposite sex. How do you do that? You learn to connect with somebody of the same sex first. We have to have our buddies. Our iron sharpens iron. And you got to have your buddies. You've got to have friends, male friends, where you're not quoting scripture all the time or are talking about uh, your, you know, using your religious terminology. But you're able to come to them and share openly who you are, be open and honest and authentic with them. That kind of dredges out the depth of your character so that you can then, with your wife, be able to be truthful and honest and open and authentic. Many men have trouble with women because they've never, ever established themselves as a man with other men. They've never learned to connect with other men. If you're disconnected from men, you're probably going to connect with a woman in an inappropriate way. So uh, we've got to go back to this reality that men become men in the company of men. And oftentimes, in the absence of a man, we turn to the female or the female image to make us feel like a man. So we turn to pornography that makes us feel like a man because we don't feel like a man. We feel inadequate in the presence of other men. Does this make sense? Doesn't make sense. Okay, well, I'll, I'll do better. I'll try harder. When we don't feel adequate with other men, 
then we compensate and sometimes overpower a woman, trample on a woman to assert ourselves so we can feel like we have power and control. And you don't fix that just by saying, okay, I'm going to be nice to my wife. You fix it by going back to the foundational feelings of competent manhood and working through that. And then the light will just come on uh, magically <laughs> when this happens. And you will you'll feel differently uh, when you have this revelation take place. It'll be exciting. I'm, I'm, I'm not kidding. It'll be visual and you'll love it. Okay. So what we want is we want men that will challenge us to be men. So you can't just go watch football all the time and, and be men. You need a small group. You need a place where you're talking about important things, where you can say it's not going so well at home. And somebody can ask and, and what's going on and, and encourage you and, and to challenge you. And so when we develop this male bond and this competent feeling as a man, where we get it out of the way, this question, am I a man? Or this question, am I more than what I make? It's a big question. Or am I more than just my accomplishments? Am I more than a paycheck? Am I a real man? When we answer that question with other men, and that's the real value of the PK, getting guys together, then we're able to have an authentic, intimate relationship with the woman because she's not having to compensate for what we didn't get otherwise. Same is true for a woman. Many of you are in a miserable marriage because daddy didn't do it for her. And so you have been expected to fix all the stuff that daddy broke inside the heart. You are expected to be all that daddy wasn't to her. And you can't be that because you're not her daddy. You're a man. And nobody can fix that father wound except your wife. She has to grieve the loss of the father that she always wanted or idealized who didn't do it all for her so that she can then accept him as he is, forgive him for what he didn't do so that she can then accept you with your limitations and they don't become this earth shattering intimacy-destroying headline every time you do something wrong that triggers something in her that reminds her of the hurt she had with that. Now, does that make sense? Okay. So, so what do you do if you sense that that might be part of the dynamic in the relationship? Well, you know what a lot of people do is that they, they keep the peace. They say, you know, I'm just going to keep the peace here. I'm not going to rock the boat. And you stay disconnected as a result. Does God honor peacekeepers? No. He honors peacemakers. And sometimes you have to disturb the peace to make peace. Proverbs 10.10 10 says, when you wink at wrong, you cause trouble. But an open rebuke leads to lasting peace. So what it's saying there is sometimes we have to get in a relationship, do some tough work together if we're going to have peace or serenity in the relationship. And a lot of people, they don't have that. They don't have a serenity. They have a detachment, but when they're together, it's conflict. And so that's why they detach. And uh, nobody's doing well when, um, when you're disconnected isolated, and detached. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12 says, two people are better off than one, but they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Likewise, two people lying close together can keep each other warm. But how can one be warm alone? A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer Three are even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. Now, God wants to be the third braid in any relationship that you have, the triple braid. 
you, spouse, you, girlfriend, God. But sadly, what we've done is we've disconnected and isolated, and our third braid is pornography, or the affair, or work, or gambling, or alcohol, or churchaholism, where, you know, because we feel so important at church, we're always there doing something at the church and neglecting uh, that one relationship that's so important. So um, if you if you start off as an adolescent objectifying women through pornography and other things, if, if you see them as objects and then you get married to an object and you still have this objectification in your mind, then you're never going to develop true intimacy with her. That is the intimacy that God uh, put into or wants you to have in marriage that would reflect his love for the church. So how do you do that? How do you go from this disconnection to an object to intimacy with a real person? Well, um, one thing is that you start uh, to be honest. That's the first thing. If you, if you don't have that, uh, well, what do you really have? If she doesn't know who you are, how can she ever trust you, be intimate with you, fully give herself to you if you're not fully honest? So that's one of the key ingredients to connection is honesty. And as I told the first group, you know, I'm from USA, uh, which is now known as the home of the big fat liars. I mean, you know, Lance Armstrong and, and all the other people that are announcing all their, their lies of a lifetime. But we all, to some degree or another, um, are the same way. We present a false front. The more us men connect with other men and can feel like we're authentic men, the less we have to present a false front. In uh, a book I've got coming out in May, The Seven-Minute Marriage Solution, it's bringing men and women together with God's word so that you, with God in that third braid, see each other as fully human, non-objectified human beings. Seven minutes a day. There's a research uh, project that was completed by Back to the Bible that found out if you read the Bible one day a week, you know what the impact is on your character and your relationships? None. Two days a week, you know what it is? None. Three days a week, none. But if you will engage in Scripture four days a week, it will change your character and the dynamics of your relationship. It will reduce the chance that you're going to... Uh, uh, have some kind of fit and, and, and rage by something like 69%. It will reduce the chance of you uh, having an affair by uh, over 60%. It changes the dynamic in the relationship. And so maybe you can find something that would bring you together with other men and then something to bring you and your wife together at a spiritual level so that you are starting to remove the objectification that is so ingrained in our society has been there for years and decades and centuries. Fifth wall, blind ignorance. It is easy to be blind to our own reality because people don't really care about telling us the truth. You know, I look at uh, Elvis Presley, uh, who, who died sitting on a toilet, constipated because, had a heart attack because he was taking so many uh, pain medications uh, that it destroyed his system and, and nobody was there to stop him. From Michael Jackson, same thing. Nobody was there to hold him back from doing what was destroying him. And many times when we get caught up in these kinds of things, we are blind to what's going on in our lives. And we've got to give people permission to tell us the truth about ourselves. And you know, you might be so full of rage and anger that nobody's gonna do it, they're afraid of you. And especially do you have to give that wife that you're married to or your girlfriend or whoever, the permission to tell you the truth. Helen Keller said, I, the saddest thing is when I see blind people who have eyes and the person that we're most blind to 
is often ourselves. Uh, I don't know if you have this show, you've seen it up here, What Not to Wear. Have you seen that show? Ever seen that? Some of you obviously haven't seen it, but uh, the, my, my wife got me watching this thing and uh, very helpful, you know, uh, like it, it tells you that if you're a man and you want to uh, be attractive to your wife, never take your pants off before you take uh, your socks off because no woman has ever seen a man standing there in his, you know, his drawers all drooping down like that and his black socks and his spindly legs and thought, wow, I got to have that. So, um, <laughs> you know, it's just, it's a helpful show. <laughs> and, you know, they take films of people that dress horrible and they bring them in a room, families all around, they got the film showing and they do a little intervention. One guy walks in, he sees all his family. He says, I'm not going to rehab. I'm not going. And no, it wasn't about that. It was about his, the way he dressed. But anyway, I was watching one day and this woman was real resistant and uh, she didn't want to change the way she dressed or looked. And then she starts crying and realizes she looked horrible. And uh, this guy, Clinton, who's on the show, he says this, I thought it was really profound. A lot of people, you know, they, they quote, Spurgeon and Tozer, and, and I, I, I quote Clinton of what not to wear. So but he says, sometimes you don't know you need help till you get help. I thought, man, that is so true. You know, if we're not willing to ever get any help for anything, uh, there's a lot of stuff that we're, we're going to miss uh, that we get rid of that's really messing our lives up. And so uh, my challenge is that, you know, maybe in this willingness thing that we talked about, that uh, if we would just become a little willing to do something maybe we've never done, sit down with a counselor, a pastor, or somebody else, open our life up to another man or to our wives, maybe we'd learn some things uh, that we didn't know. You know, the, the opposite of ignorance is not knowledge. It's obedience. A lot of people think that the truth will set them free. The truth doesn't set you free. The Bible doesn't say the truth sets you free. Here's what the Bible says. It says, if you follow my teachings, you are truly my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. There's a big then. And before that then is I must obey. I must be a disciple. I must be a follower of Jesus. So it is in obedience where, where, we, where, we, where we do the right thing. And we have the support around us. That is where we work through our blind ignorance and become real connecting human beings with our wives and with other people. All right. Got a few minutes left. Anybody have a comment or a question that you've been... You'd like that. Who, who would be first to ask a question or make a comment about these five walls that stand in our way of living the life that Christ has called us to live? Is your wife next door preaching to the women? Is my wife next door? No, she's home taking care of our six children, <laughs> ages three to 22. It's amazing. I've got a t shirt. No, I'm not the grandfather. It's, uh, it's. <laughs> I have a three-year-old, three-year-old little girl. I went into the store the other day, asked the lady if she could tell me where the diapers were. She looks at me and she goes, well, it all depends. Now, that, <laughs> that, that was not necessary. <laughs> but it's good. We go to the uh, Holiday Inn. We get, I get the senior discount. Kids eat free. They're almost paying us to be there. It's, it's, <laughs> Yeah. Anybody have a question or a comment? Yes, right back there. Hey, the question is, uh, how do you balance out? You know, you want to be confident in Christ, but you don't want to be arrogant. And uh, many times it's the arrogance that isolates us. And, um, you know, I, I just, for me, um, it's a question, are you here to serve or be served? And uh, in business, I've always found, and in ministry, the people that serve are the ones that uh, finish strong at the end. You can claw your way up so far for so long, uh, but then you're empty. And so um, it's, you know, you, you should just try to be more like me is what I'm saying. You, it, but, uh, 
no, seriously, I, I think it, it, it's taking what you have and giving it to God every day and say, God, help me make somebody feel good about themselves. Uh, help me try to meet their need. Even if I have to tell them no, uh, even if I have to be right and they're wrong, or I have to win this contract and they lose it, help me do it in a way uh, that reflects you. You don't retreat because you're a Christian. You don't lose because you're a Christian, but you just do it in a way that leaves people in a better place. Uh, otherwise, you're just going in, seeing what you can win to build up, you know, whatever it is. And then I tell you, when you come to that place in your life where you see that it all comes from God anyway, um, and, and, and it doesn't matter what you make or what you achieve, what matters is what you keep and what is respectable in your achievement. Uh, you just start to see the world in a different way. That's a great question. Somebody else have a, a comment or a question any, anywhere? Yes, sir, right there. Uh, Why is it so hard for men to get it about Christianity? Yeah, they, 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 seem to be, uh, they, they don't think it's important or true. Well, you know, I think uh, a big part of it, it, it's not, it doesn't have anything to do with Jesus, uh, but it's, it's like um, Alec Baldwin said. He said, you know, uh, the only thing that I don't like about Christianity is Christians. And uh, I, I think we need more people that are authentic and real, trying to live out the life of Jesus uh, for people to be drawn to the Christian faith. And uh, many of us didn't have good role models. Uh, we didn't have people to show us how to do it, but we've got a chance to show our children how to do it. That's good. Lots of the men out there, they want to be leaders and they get on their pride versus a woman, like he's saying, because women so lots of times will look for humility, right? But men, like you describe, men will look weak, right? And they're pride, they think, well, well, we are prideful and we don't want to look weak. Yes, I, I think that's men true. Are susceptible to that image of women, right? right. But uh, again, we go back to here's, uh, here's Jesus um, trying to show us as graphically as possible. We need to be servant leaders, and he's washing feet, and he's dying on a cross. Uh, but we still don't get it. And, um, you know, in my life, I've, I've been as guilty as anybody. Uh, but fortunately, I'm humble now, and uh, I'm writing a book on how to be humble like me. So uh, I'll get that to you as soon as it comes out. Okay, yes, sir. One, one more comment there or question. Yes, sir. Globally, it's hard to maintain a men's ministry in the church globally. Yes. What would you recommend as a good platform for us men in the Yeah. Well, you know, uh, to me, uh, one of the, the great values of, of Promise Keepers when it comes to town is that, you know, it gives you a, an excuse to say to a guy, hey, come on, let's go to this thing. And, and you hear some good music and hear somebody speak. And uh, many times a church uh, it, it can't produce that kind of thing. And so you need that kind of thing once a year. But the rest of the time, what I think is you, you need to have men in small groups with other families for it to be a really great men's ministry. In other words, I don't think a church should feel bad if they don't have a uh, Bible study where 50 men show up on a, on a Wednesday morning. That'd be a great thing. But a greater thing would be having five families in a small group and those men are together and they're, they're connecting with wives and children. And I really believe in churches and small groups. You know, going to church, uh, that's one thing. But getting involved in a small group in a church, totally different thing. And, uh, you know, there's not, I mean, I, I say go and worship God on Sunday, but if you really want to see life change, you have to get involved in a small group. Uh, I, I was listening to Billy Graham talk the other day. Uh, well, he went, was a talk from 98 and he was on a plane and there was a drunk guy bothering the flight attendants and annoying everybody. And a, a governor was seated across from Billy Graham and he says to the drunk guy, Hey, come on, do you know who's on this plane? It's Billy Graham. The drunk guy looks at Billy Graham and walks over to him and gets about his seat and goes, Mr. Graham, you have no idea the impact you've had on my life. <laughs> and and, and uh, Billy Graham says, uh, yes, I'm sure I've had the same impact on many lives uh, over the years. But the point was, you know, uh, hearing somebody talk, it's just 
It's just so, it just does so much. But you got to get involved with other people at an intimate level. Are we, are we out of time? All right, can I just pray for you guys? I didn't pray for the last group, and they, they're probably going to have a bad experience the rest of the week. <laughs> let me just, they really didn't need it, but I sense that you do. So let me pray for you. God, I thank you for each person here. And um, I pray that maybe they could just find one little, one wall that they could work on when they leave from this weekend. Just one wall. They say, I'm going to go home. I'm going to do that. I'm going to work on that part. Uh, you give them strength and courage. Help them join together. Help us to, to be competent and confident men as we humbly serve those around us. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Break Forth Fully Alive podcast. We pray you were richly blessed. But before we leave you, we want to remind you again to head over to our website at breakforthministries.com where you'll learn more about our tours to the lands of the Bible, our resources, inspiring videos, workshops, our online and in-person events, and more. Until next time, may you become fully alive in the love of God.